from now. Hi everybody, welcome to today's data science education webinar. I'm Natalia St. Clair and with me today is Lisa Hardy. This webinar is being made available through the Concord Consortium, a nonprofit educational technology laboratory based in Concord, Massachusetts and in Emeryville, California. You can learn more at our website, concord.org forward slash meetup. I'd like to introduce you to our facilitator, Lisa Hardy, who will be talking about a Concord Consortium project in SPECT. In this presentation, Lisa will talk about ongoing research into students' experiences using sensors and data flow software to produce their own data in the context of independent inquiries projects. Lisa is a research associate interested in fundamental research and technology-enhanced STEM learning, as well as designating and developing technology-based learning environments for K-12 and undergraduate STEM classrooms. She's a colleague of mine too and a joy to work with. A recorded version of this webinar will be made available on YouTube. We will email you details about it through Eventbrite after the event. If you are comfortable sharing your name and face, please turn on your web camera during the webinar event so that we can see you. I'd also like to emphasize that the format of this webinar is participatory by design. This means that we'll work together to decide the conversations, the connections, and activities we want to discuss today. I will facilitate the live questions that you have via the Zoom chat, and I will also look at the text-based questions as well. Lisa will be pausing throughout the webinar for any questions, so if you have any, please let us know. For those of you just joining us, welcome to our webinar. Our speaker today is Lisa Hardy, who will be speaking about the INSPECT project. Lisa, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, great. Hi everybody. Yep, um, I am Lisa. I work at the Concord Consortium Research Associate. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here to show some slides. All right, is that good? Cool. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is some very recent and ongoing work that we're doing on the INSPECT project. Um, we're looking at how students create data in science classes um, and with an eye now toward um, how this is going to prepare them for more formal data science education experiences. So um, what I will talk about today is just way, ways that we think about, um, there are kind of two parts. One is going to be, or the first part is about what we think are important about these experiences for preparing students for engaging with um, different data sets in data science and um, and then also some empirical work that we're doing with kids um, in schools where they're uh, producing data themselves with sensors and with with designed software um, for some context uh, this is the inspect project the inspect project more broadly is about um, integrating computational thinking into science classes into uh, high school biology in particular so students have um, they have sensors uh, we or we give them these these kits of hardware so they've got um, sensors that connect to a raspberry pi computer that collects this data from the sensors sends it to the internet um, where they can then uh, see that data and um, and export it to another software code app for analysis, or um, what they can do also in Dataflow, it acts sort of like a uh, programming environment similar to LabVIEW for data acquisition and control. So there's some programming that you can do on, on the software where you can send down programs to uh, the Raspberry Pi to have them run and not only just collect the data, but also do things like control, um, control variables using actuators, like turning on and off, uh, turning on and off a heater to control um, or stabilize temperature of some ecosystem. So a large part of what we're looking at is how um, that sort of activity and doing control in the context of uh, scientific experimentation can um, be a place to integrate computational thinking into, into uh, experimental science classes. Uh, so students in INSPECT projects do um, a lot of hands-on um, experimentation. Uh, there are, um, the, these students are uh, all doing experiments with uh, eco columns. So they build and design um, these bottle, bottle uh, ecosystems but they integrate um, carbon dioxide and temperature and humidity sensors so that they can look at sort of what's happening inside this ecosystem. Um, these photos were all in cases where 
students were looking at uh, the health of the ecosystem through data. But um, what I'm going to talk about more today is about um, what sorts of experiences that students might need in science class, um, and particularly ones like this, where they're doing design, they're creating data themselves, they're trying to make sense of it. Um, how can these experiences prepare them for uh, a more formal data science education? And so part of that, um, what's interesting, I think, uh, about this is that data science involves often um, extracting insights or working with data that you didn't create yourself for that purpose. So while in science, typically you are you're trying to understand something and you create data to help you understand it. In data science, there, it's often you're working with data that somebody else created or that was created for other purposes that weren't your own and you didn't create it yourself. And so um, these are just all images, you know, pulled from the internet of different repositories and places that you can go and, and download these, these data sets. This is from, I think, Kaggle.com, which is just this, um, repository or collection of a ton of different data sets and also people's analyses of them that they're pu that are published um, but since uh, now you know like BuzzFeed or 538 they're producing these data sets and publishing them online that you can go and access and do your own analyses with as sort of a um, claim checking uh, mechanism um, but all of these um, all of these are data sets that are sort of out of context that you didn't, the, the people who are working with them, like either, either students or people who are just accessing and downloading these data sets, they're not typically familiar with the ways that they are created, what methods um, were used to produce that data or what purposes were those, those data were created for in the first place. And um, what we think is that this is important um, going to be an important component of a data science education where learners will need to be able to ask not just how can we extract insights from this data, like what are ways of working with data or methods and tools that I can use to extract insights, but also about where did these data come from and how and why were they produced in the first place. Um, we think that this is necessary, that these questions are necessary not just um, well, partially for data science to be, um, to prepare students to understand data sets through the lens of purpose, we think is, is important that students can start to wonder what, for what purposes data can be used. Um, and also uh, to be effective because what I will talk about in the next few sections is um, ways in which context, the context in which data is created is very important to actually understanding or working with or trying to extract insights from that data. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, what we're interested in is this sort of transition. So going, having students go from science data in science class to data science. Um, and it's this sort of idea that if they're producing data in science class in context that they're very familiar with the data and how it's produced, that this might be a good opportunity or good context for them to learn these sorts of skills or habits of mind or uh, to have experience taking particular perspectives on data that will prepare them for, the, for understanding and working with these data sets that they're not creating. Um, and there's, a few aspects of this, uh, how, you're, how we're going to prepare students for, um, for future understanding and engagement with data sets depends on what the goal is. Um, we could have the goal of preparing students in science class for just continuing experience in data science education. Um, we could aim to prepare them for entering the workforce, for example, by, um, through developing skills with particular skills with working with data. Um, and there, there's also a, sort of a need to prepare students um, to be informed citizens in an age where data is everywhere and these big data sets um, are easily accessible and also, also still sort of opaque. Um, but then we're also in this era where uh, um, even though data is everywhere, 
and data has typically sort of been this like material stuff of evidence where evidence is less necessary to making arguments than it once was. And this is the sort of this post-truth idea that um, is the theme of next year's AERA and was the Oxford English Dictionary's um, year of, or word of the year for uh, 2015 or 2016. So um, we're at sort of an interesting time for preparing students to understand data and understand um, particularly data that is everywhere or that appears to be everywhere. And so what, are, what we think are important things to teach students about data are summarized here uh, that in, in this view that data is produced. Um, we often talk about data as data collection, that um, either scientists collect data or we have students collect data. Uh, and collection sort of implies that the data, it is there, it's this natural thing, and you just kind of go and collect it. And it's this very passive process. And um, what I want to do is advocate for this view that data is produced. It is not, a, it's not just collected, it's actively produced by people with technologies that are designed and that aren't neutral and uh, for particular purposes. They do it for a reason, in a context, and in a broader social, political, economic context. And that, uh, so this is the sort of Venn diagram. So there, there are humans, uh, they have purposes, they act within communities of practice. There are, they use designs technologies, um, which have been built up over time as part of that community for producing data and for working with data and for arguing with data. And all of this happens still in the material world. This happens in some material context. And so data how is produced basically right at this, you know, right at this intersection of all of these three things. And these are three aspects of what is important to understand about context or the context in which data is produced. Um, so I want to kind of look at each of these things in um, a little bit more detail and try and understand and talk about more like how these designs technologies play a role and what data gets produced and why does that matter for data science? Why is this an important thing for students to understand? Um, so I'm going to start here at this sort of intersection between material world and designs technologies. Um, so all of these, all of these views are things that um, we're drawing on from studies of science. So uh, science, uh, histor historians, philosophers and uh, sociologists of science have studied for a long time how people can extract information or extract insights uh, from data and about about some natural phenomenon and they have historically um, sort of problematized this idea that that uh, this process might be easy that you can just kind of collect data and interpret it in a straightforward way uh, and so one of the things, one of the themes in this sort of, in this literature on uh, science practice is the idea that data comes from a place, it comes from this sort of intersection between natural and technological. And where exactly that is, is, um, is, up for, is a subject of debate. But um, uh, I'm going to use an example. It, uh, or a few examples from, um, from history of science to talk about this. So uh, the idea is that scientists, are, scientists create data to understand phenomena that we can't see with our, with our eyes, that we need to use technology in order to make visible to us. So this is, um, uh, an example is in photography. The, in the sort of early science of photography, uh, a long time ago, they uh, were developing photographic plates, so these sorts of emulsions that would um, interact with the material world and the surrounding light and would leave um, these traces when you've developed them through some procedure, uh, leave traces of the material world, and this became data. So they created these sort of stable records. Uh, and However, that it was never clear 
when they were doing this, sort of what features of these images were real and what sorts of, what of them were due to the ways that that uh, photograph was produced. So on, this le on the left right here, this image is from um, what at, at that time, what they were studying was this idea that um, humans had basically auras, that we had this fluid that was coming off of us all the time and this was based on, um, I think, sort of accounts of people claiming to see, see such things. And so this was a photograph of fingerprints um, that was used as evidence of these fluids that were coming off of, um, that surrounded people. And they were using this as a sort of diagnostic tool also to try and look at, um, okay, this person is depressed and they don't have these fluids. And here's this person who has lots of sort of fluid behavior. And it, this was um, the subject of a lot of uh, a lot of activity around this, and a lot of attempts to reproduce it and understand it. And people would try uh, to reproduce this with dead dead people's hands and um, with iron hands heated up to different temperatures. And eventually, did, they did figure out that this is it was due to heat, not to fluids. Um, but at the time, this idea about that what this data was of whether whether these features right here these uh sort of markings surrounding fingerprints it wasn't clear whether this was some real or natural phenomenon or whether it was just an, an artifact of how this was produced and so this is one example but this is a sort of characteristic feature of science that when you're on this edge of producing new phenomenon that you're not sure, that scientists are never sure which features of their data are due to something real and which are just some artifact of how it got produced. Um, some other examples, I think my notes disappeared down here, but um, there are other examples um, in sort of the, the history of um, microscope development or telescope development, which are all just kind of nice examples because these are technologies used to make things visible to us in a very direct way. Um, but I won't talk about those. So what, it, what the effect of this is, is that data are always technologically produced and the ways that they're produced are always sort of, there's traces of it left on data. Um, I like this quote down here from at the bottom, so I stuck it in, but, um, it says that data are heavily dependent on the peculiarities of, for example, the particular experimental design, detection devices, or data gathering procedures which the investigator applies. Um, so data are peculiar and idiosyncratic. Um, they always sort of reflect the way that they're produced, and that becomes necessary to think about. And so in a, we're, um, and as an example of that, um, a sort of more recent example of that uh, was this global warming hiatus. Um, so this was due to uh, measurements made of, of surface ocean temperatures and that what they had showed originally was that there was a sort of drop off in the rate of increase of temperature uh, over, the uh, over the last part of the century. And um, it was subject to, um, well, let's see. So this, what, what, what this article, this was, um, I think in 2015, uh, was saying, provided a reanalysis of this data set that took into account sort of the ways that the actual um, data collection mechanisms and methods produced that data, and there was this artificial sort of increasing of the temperature or a bias of the temperature just due to the, the particular ways in which this data was collected. Um, but this had been sort of a scandal at the time that, um, or you know, so it was talked about as a sort of scandal that um, whether this data were manipulated, the data were manipulated um, for the, for these, reasons, um, whether or not, you know, it, it was a big shift in interpreting this data first as evidence of global warming stopping of it. It's not really a big deal. There's no um, trend anymore to saying, no, it, it 
there is a trend, this data confirms it, we were analyzing it in a way that didn't reflect the actual material conditions in which it was created. So um, even though those other examples were from, you know, development of photography or uh, of telescopes or something like this, this idea that data is always, um, always reflects the material environment means that one of the questions that we should help uh, that we should strive for for learners to understand or to ask of data is what features of these data are due to a real phenomenon and which to the way it was produced. And so we think of this as this sort of teasing apart of, um, of fact from artifact is, uh, or for, of signal from noise. So understanding that some things are real um, or some features of this data might represent a real phenomenon but some of it might also just reflect the way that it got produced. And there's a sort of, um, I think, taking a, uh, being critical of, of this, or uh, maybe it might be like a habit of mind of coming up with alternative explanations for what other things might explain that data. And that would be a scientific sort of, um, of way of thinking about any results that come from a data set. Um, I think now would be a good time to pause for any questions, if there are any. Um, um, so right now there are not any questions, Lisa. We do, we do have a wonderful group though. I don't know if you have a chance while we're fielding questions, but do read through the introductions and you'll see some of um, our audience members who are here in um, regards to data science education. Uh, well, Lisa, leads through that, I just wanted to pause and ask, did anybody have any questions that they wanted to ask live while Lisa's here? I'm not sure if I know how to see the questions. I don't see any coming up. Uh, look in the chat interface in Zoom. Hmm. Um, chat's okay. Hmm, okay, I can't see it right now. All right, let me know if, if there are any questions. So I, ha I have a question that I'm, I've been <clears throat> wrestling with as uh, part of my dissertation. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do data, data collection with kindergartners and um, I'm using uh, Latour, Cascades of Inscription. Yeah. And, and 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 also Roth, and I'm wondering how, in terms of you mentioned like uh, scientists work as a, a community of practice, and there are certain norms within those communities for collecting data. And I'm trying to figure out how much, um, like since I'm working with kindergartners, I want to create, I guess, a new, a new, a new. A method specific for their data collection and they're collecting temperature data yeah so I guess how much do I do it the canonical way and how much how do we how do we design for students okay I really like that question um, that is sort of a, something we're also that, that I will also talk about um, there are we're doing this but with um, freshman biology students and I think there's a tension between um, how we want to, we want them to know about and, and adopt the normative sort of tools for producing data and for um, evaluating their data. But we also want them to be able to, uh, to create their own and to try them out and to modify them and to take up existing tools when it suits their purposes. Um, and so that might be something that goes, that you know can be, taking back to kindergarten, but that, that is something that we, we're thinking about a lot in this context. Um, and this sort of how, um, what, are the, what are the normative um, and acceptable methods of producing inscriptions and producing, producing data um, is my next theme of what students should know about data. So I will, I will continue from there. 
Um, so one thing that also came up in the chat um, just via introductions is um, Rob uh, Lippincott, a uh, school program designer, said that he's looking for ways to introduce students, ninth and 10th graders, to data science. Do you have uh, any resources that maybe we could point him to? Any what? Like resources or things like that? Introductions to data science for ninth or 10th? Uh, not off of the top of my head. I don't have them prepared. That's something I'd be willing to either talk about after or try and um, connect. Yeah, I, I could think of a few off the top of my head, Rob, just so you know. Um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, put together a list of links and I'll put it in chat towards the end of the webinar too, but let's definitely revisit this question. Okay, um, so these sorts of pro these sorts of problems with data, uh, the ways in which they don't just nap, they don't just really accurately reflect some real phenomenon, but uh, there's something that, that has to be carefully sort of considered and teased apart, um, have been uh, referred to as failed references um, or material resistances. These are problems, um, problems with data that are due to the way that um, sort of the, the fact that they are produced in this material real world setting, um, but that this is fundamental to scientific progress. This is a little bit of a side, a side note, um, but that these problems with data cause scientists, they're what drive scientists to re-engineer their devices to, um, to produce and to better capture data. And so this, uh, I pulled this spiral from, um, from a paper on uh, talking about physics as, um, as techno-scientific activity. So techno-science was a Latour's um, term for how science should be, should be thought of, but as, as basically all technology and all design, but where um, what these, these devices and ways of producing data co-evolve very tightly with um, scientific knowledge and with their understanding of the underlying phenomena and their understanding of the devices and how to produce data. Um, but let's see. Okay. But the second point is that, so since scientific activity involves developing these ways to produce data, to produce good data, and this includes, um, methods of producing it, hardware for producing it, um, practices and, um, ways of analyzing it and transforming it, um, that these technologies in the literature on uh, history and philosophy of, of science are talked about as having, as, em, as embodying human knowledge about uh, how to produce good data. So, um, the, and this, I only just pulled these things to highlight that we're not talking about just the creation of data, like how does data, where does it come from at its sort of inception, but also these technologies for transforming data and what happens to it after it's initially produced. Um, so what the, this sort of theme we're trying to identify is important for, for data science um, and for data science educators to think about is that these technologies aren't, are not neutral, they're designed, they're human uh, technologies, that they embed our current understanding of what phenomena are important, how to measure them, how to capture them as data. Um, and this has been um, referred to as a ha that they have this uh, phenomenological profile that uh, and it's been suggested by this guy here that um, that what we're really studying is is that we're studying this data is produced by these devices rather than studying sort of a natural um, phenomenon. But I think this is an important thing for data science, this, this idea of um, inbuilt intention or um, the knowledge embedded in these tools for working with data, um, I think is important. And so I'm gonna give some examples of ways that it, that it shows up even in just regular sorts of data. Um, so if you think about um, survey instruments, just standard survey instruments where we, um, try to like capture this sort of phenomenon or capture um, ideas about uh, gender and ethnicity here. It embeds ideas about what those, what those things are and how we might measure them. And so this is, um, has come up 
in, term, in ways that ethnicity has historically been measured, um, whether it's uh, as mutually exclusive categories or a multi-dimensional sort of construct, um, and how we, how we measure gender and how that has shifted on surveys or will continue to shift, I think, on, um, for example, survey data. But when you uh, encounter some data set that has, you know, that has this as a profile, that has these in the sort of categories and ways of collecting data, or as ways of, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's as columns in a table or something like that, that these are not neutral. These reflect whoever created that, that data. It reflects their understanding of what might be important things to capture, what might be important, uh, uh, what might be important dimensions of some natural phenomenon that they're trying to understand. And so not only what are, what are the, what aspects of that are important, but how they can be captured. So is it as a survey with a male slash male or female um, checkbox or something? Um, the second example is just that these data transformations that every time you do something to your data, it, also embeds some sort of understanding about what that what that does and what value that holds for um, for producing good or for producing good or valuable data um, and I think mean median and mode are sort of um, a straight sort a sort of straightforward example of the ways that you know this transformation of data so like taking an average or methods of averaging Reflect, have different weightings of different points. What matters to us? What matters to the questions that we're, that we're trying to answer by doing this data transformation? Is it um, what sort of measure mat, um, matters and how much do we care about outliers or how much do we care about deviation from, from the mean or from, from the um, deviation from the norm? Um, and then the other, the other reason that I think this is an interesting, this, this idea of inbuilt knowledge or inbuilt intention is interesting for data science is because that we, we have this uh, algorithms and ways of working with data that are becoming, them, that themselves have um, sort of this un, knowledge of unknown origin embedded in them. And this has caused problems um, recently where, uh, where machine learning algorithms or uh, image processing algorithms, natural language processing algorithms are start are just reflecting sort of biases um, in the in the data sets that were, they were trained on. But um, it's important to recognize, I think, that these tools, these things that um, that we use to and technologies to work with data or to try and extract insights from data have embedded in them um, knowledge from somewhere. Um, so recent, recent examples are th of this third point of the machine learning algorithms were, um, uh, I don't know where my, I had notes on here in my, with links to all these and they're not showing up. So I'll fix that before I, I post the um, slides. But uh, so there are um, uh, racial biases uncovered in um, machine learning algorithms used to predict uh, recidivism rates based on photographs. Um, and then the uh, natural language processing algorithms trained um, on the internet, like trained on just data from the internet, were displaying sort of human-like implicit biases in word and word associations. So um, these these algorithms that we that we use and that are being developed in data science in order to do this sort of extraction of insights from data are um, have an embedded knowledge that's worth inspecting. I think. Okay, so that's question two. Um, what knowledge and assumptions are embedded in in these tools that we're that we're working with, um, both to produce and transform um, the data. And the last one um, comes back a little bit more uh, to what you were talking about, Ryan, that data are um, intentionally created. This, uh, and so yeah, here's the Latour. Um, all right, so data are in, created intentionally. Uh, they don't just naturally exist to be collected, but they are, they are produced intentionally with technologies um, for somebody's purpose, for some, or for some group of, of people's purposes. And that all of this happens within a broader context. Um, so the way of um, 
so in, in this sort of view, these transformations of data that happen um, from going from going from initial production of way, ways that data is initially produced and captured to transforming it um, iteratively and working with it, um, that each of those transformation, each of those transformations gives it this sort of power within some within some community. Uh, where that power is, it's rhetorical, it's an argumentative power. Um, and so sort of in, in this view, in Latour's view, uh, science is, uh, it really is, um, it's rhetoric, it's argument that's taking place um, around, around data, where uh, the ways of working with data are what give it power in this argument. Um, and yeah, enough that he, describes technologies like sensors and the ways of producing data as rhetorical devices, like not just actual devices, devices, but rhetorical devices. And um, also where, you know, it, looking at scientific activity as this sort of argument, this rhetorical, arg uh, rhetorical argument means that um, it's the winners of that argument who sort of establish how that, how these things will be investigated in the future. What sorts of lines of inquiry um, become stabilized and acceptable and valuable within that community of practice? And also, what are the acceptable methods and, and ways of producing data um, about it? Okay, so that the, this idea that data are created in a context, um, I think is important. This slide was unfinished. Um, I apologize about that, but um, so this is uh, from, uh, these are uh, refined, okay, air quality, the, the, the broader point of this is that um, investigations uh, like uh, citizen science investigations, for example, of air quality are not, um, that data doesn't just exist, it has to be advocated for. Somebody has to fund those sensors, somebody has to put it there. These are efforts that are ongoing where, where um, citizens living around, uh, say, refineries in Venetia, or um, this guy lived near, um, on the out, uh, sort of outside of a fracking site, that this is, that this requires um, organization and advocacy and effort and um, that it doesn't happen separate from, um, separate from politics and economics and, um, uh, yes. So uh, in, in this case, this really what, um, there was a case, and again, my, um, all my links are gone down at the bottom, but uh, this case of um, refineries in Phoenicia, what was happening is that there's, um, a lot of pollution being created by these refineries and where um, residents who sort of live on the outskirts are um, using, using um, air quality sensors to monitor, um, so to, to try and monitor that pollution. But there's this argument going on over time about whether or not that, um, whether or not there is pollution, whether or not it's over, acceptable levels because those levels are not established um, really. And uh, there's this sort of criteria where, um, where in order to make a claim that, that those refineries are harming local residents, um, that it's detrimental to their health, that you need very good persuasive data. And uh, so they, um, I think in this case uh, where this picture um, the article that this picture came from, um, it came down to whether or not the sensors themselves were uh, were sensitive enough or whether they were accurate enough to um, to make these sorts of claims. And here um, in the Benicia case, it was also that you need not just data about the air quality, you need data about residents' health in order to make a sort of claim, claim that these are that these are related. Um, so these are uh, I just, um, okay, so these are to communicate just this idea that, that data collection, uh, data sets, where they come from happens in some broader context, that there's more going on um, socially or politically that produced these data sets. Um, 
And so the last thing, uh, this sort of theme that I think is important for, for future data science education is to see that data sets are created for a purpose and that they have a particular rhetorical power um, asso associated with them. Okay, and here's just sort of a summary. So oh, this is the data are produced framework. There are, um, it, takes, it takes people with intentions and purpose. It takes technologies that have been designed over time and which embody knowledge about phenomenon. And uh, this all happens in, this, in some material context. Um, okay, so this is, all right, so here's a summary of up until this point. Or I think this is probably another good time for any questions. Um, anybody? Yeah, there is a question from Liz uh, Sylvan. Um, the, the question is, I train teachers on ways to embed data work across the curriculum. I struggle with how to talk about data in the post-truth era. Specifically, science has some answers built on an understanding of data, yet data is inherently biased. So teachers can lead some teachers or their students to conclusion that science does not produce valid knowledge and actionable information. And the next step is to believe that scientific argumentation can always be discarded. Uh, the question is, how do others address this concern? So Lisa, why don't you go ahead and pitch in, and then if other people would like to uh, discuss, I think that that would be a great question for us to stop and think about. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so we've also been talking about this question, um, and we don't know what the right answer is here, because, uh, it, and I think it is, it is a tricky question because you want kids to be skeptical of data and what it means, what it, if, if uh, interpretations are valid, and you want them to be critical of it, but you don't want them to be so skeptical of all data that they don't uh, trust other people, like that they don't trust that data can ever say anything. Um, and I, I know that there's been a parallel sort of argument um, in media literacy and media skepticism and criticism that when you say um, students should be uh, skeptical or critical of, of media that they see, that it sort of opens up almost too much space for criticism where you can, it can lead to sort of distrust in the entire institution, which is not what we want. So, um, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a, Super interesting question, and I would I would love to hear what anybody else, um, ha what other people think about this. Absolutely. Did anybody else want to pitch in? Well, Liz, looks like you're muted. Is somebody? I think so. Um, I, I, I guess while we, um, while we figure out, um, oh, Susanna said uh, in the back channel that she remembers Neil deGrasse Tyson saying something along with, uh, like about that, which I, I, I suppose is what Lisa said. Um, I guess from my point of view, like I always kind of constantly thinking about like, what is the role of a data science or data scientist and I think that the ultimate goal of a data scientist is to be an advocate for the data um, and thinking about the data. Now, of course, we won't be asking questions and making meaning of it, but, you know, ultimately, like, I would say that what a data scientist does is uh, advocate the data in some way. Um, what I can also, just thinking out loud, is that, um, this is a really important and critical issue, especially like in the NGSS practices. Uh, one of the practices is, of course, um, asking questions of data. And I think that's something that um, we're struggling with in our IS2, in Core Space 2 project, is how do we make sure that we are both promising to the NGSS practices of aligning our curriculum with asking questions of data and also, um, you know, playing that role in media literacy that Lisa's speaking to. So it, it's a great question and it's one that I personally struggle with as well, actually. So I'm, I'm glad that Liz brought it up. 
Okay. Um, Susanna says in the background that Neil deGrasse Tyson says something related to the nature of science as a more dynamic search for truth and an absolute and static reality. That's beautiful. Yeah, okay. Um, I think I will go on unless there are more questions. Um, okay, so let's just Let's just say that this is the view that we want students to take on data, to see data as actively produced by people and technologies in the world. Um, then the question is what sorts of science learning experiences could lead to that? Like what did they need, what sorts of things do they need to experience in their high school biology class that would lead to this sort of view of data that we think will bridge toward this sort of understanding of data more broadly? Um, and so uh, school science is likely a very important context for oh. students to under to, for students to develop these sorts of views on and relationships to data. It's a place where now due to sort of low cost uh, available sensors, they can produce their own data in ways where they're very familiar with the context and the purposes for which it was created. So um, to ask what, what sorts of science learning experiences are necessary when in, in thinking about that question, um, we've done a lot of thinking about, about school, school science um, investigations typically in the ways that students often um, create data in the context of schools. And it's often um, done in ways, like if you consider um, sort of standard, more standard laboratory procedures where students um, are given, given a set of tools, they're given a set of methods, um, they're asked to produce a particular type of data and do a particular thing with it. So um, in these ways, uh, it's, there, yeah, there's this sort of strong, um, strong prescription. Uh, the data, it's intent, it's well-intended. Reason to do that, the reason to follow steps, the reason to use particular methods is because those have been built up over time as ways to produce really good data that you can interpret in light of a particular conceptual model. So, if we want students to come to some particular understanding of a scientific concept, then let's produce data to show them, to, to show them um, some particular phenomenon. But what this, what this means is that students have really limited on count encounters with all of the ways that data are actually really problematic in science that there um it's often uh very unclear where if it's coming from something real if it's uh just this our fact or artifact signal or noise whether it's um something real or if it's something that's just due to the way it got produced um it's all Technologies for producing data, um, either methods or ways of transforming data, are often, when they're prescribed, are often, um, they're used without necessarily understanding why they were used. So um, you can, like, think of um, some sort of example, like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So say in the context of uh, the stuff we'll be talking about later, um, students are doing experiments with photosynthesis. Uh, they're using carbon dioxide sensors to produce um, data related to photosynthesis in closed containers. And so one way to structure this sort of experience for them would be to say, okay, take 10 wet spinach leaves and place them flat in a container with a lid tightly sealed on the top. And all of those things that are embedded in there, the 10 leaves um, are specified because if you vary the number of leaves, you get data that's hard to interpret. If they're not wet, then the signal is decreased. If you're, they're not laid out flat, then you don't really know anything about the surface area of, uh, of spinach leaves. And if you don't seal the container tightly, then you get leaks and um, your data reflects something more about the ambient conditions rather than the actual phenomenon that you're trying to isolate. So just in, in these ways that we prepare data for students, we prepare these, these, um, prepare these laboratories for students, they don't get to encounter the ways in which data were actually really sort of contingent on the way it was produced. It's in this sort of way that's handed down to them rather than in ways where they can develop it themselves and say, oh, my 
data didn't make sense. Maybe my container was leaky. Let's try to seal it up better and try to, or that would be sort of an alternative pathway that would take longer. But, um, and the other effect of this is that students have um, limited conceptual agency where this is their own ability to make sense of things um, using their own prior, using prior knowledge uh, to create purposes for, for creating data that are aligned with their own interests. Um, and let me think. Okay, let me move on. So what we're advocating for is that in order to encounter, for, for students to come to this view of data, that data is produced, that this, um, what they should, what science learning could look like is, um, is a mangle of practice. And this comes from a description of scientific activity from um, Andrew Pickering. He wrote um, a book on the, called The Mangle of Practice. Uh, and in this sort of description of science, it's, it's um, like what we were talking about in, um, in the chat channel, that it's, science is not sort of direct, it's not, does not progress in these linear stages. It is um, this sort of iterative, uh, um, cyclical process in which producing any sort of knowledge is tied to um, redesigning things and working in the material world on ways to produce data in better. Um, and where these sorts of understandings about, about uh, devices and about methods and about, about scientific phenomena all sort of co-evolve in this nonlinear um, in this nonlinear way. Uh, and an important part of that, and in, in that view of science, these ways where data was a problem, where data became problematic, uh, it was like these failed references earlier when it's not clear what, that, what these features of the data really mean or what they're due to, um, they are a fundamental part of that picture of science, that we want students to, um, to encounter messy, weird, bad, problematic data, and use and where the in ways that are productive for their activity so in ways that drive forward the activity when you see something that you can't quite understand and so you redesign your experiment to do it a little better and make the make this data make this data better so we think that this is just sort of a different a shift in the ways that students um can produce data um either in the ways where they're data collectors in this sort of school science way that they're just kind of doing these procedures versus data producers where they are actively involved in producing data and in deciding on the ways it's and in designing the ways to produce it um okay so i'm going to move on all right so i should have removed that um okay so what we did is we went uh to a school in in northern california um we worked with three periods of an introductory science. It was a science practice course. It was not a content. It was not a, uh, a course in a particular discipline or and not in biology, um, but uh, taught by a teacher here, um, Mr. B. Uh, and what we had, we had, we brought a ton of sensors. We brought all these sensor kits um, and hardware kits for the students uh, and um, they used our this software data flow, which I'll show in a second what that looks like um, to create data. They did a few different things. Um, they first they there, let me move this around. Okay, so first what they did was they tinkered around with with these materials for um, two class periods. So this was where um, they were doing things like using using these sensors and actuators and the software to um, build a, a fan that would turn on when your the co2 level reached some peak um, or across some threshold i mean uh, and so they were building these things like this uh, we had them try and build things that they found were useful or interesting and sort of explain how they worked and this this was intended to get them familiar with the technology that they would about that they were about to be using to produce data in a way that was sort of playful and also highlighted um, the fact that these are really useful um, 
these are useful tools and not just for science, but these create things like uh, the same sorts of, it's the same sorts of technology that are used for, um, you know, motion detectors or for clap on clap off lights or, you know, we saw students sort of recognizing all of these different uh, uses of these tools. Um, so after that sort of tinkering stage, they moved on to, um, they had two class periods for uh, initial, um, an initial observation of photosynthesis and respiration. So this is where we did say, okay, you have, um, we, what we want you to do is produce two data sets. One where you take spinach and seal it up in a container and, um, and collect data for 10 minutes in the dark and one where you collect data for 10 minutes in the light. Uh, what happens when you do this, if you just take regular salad spinach and put it in a container and seal it up with a CO2 sensor inside, the, the CO2 level will rise pretty linearly, um, even over like 10 minutes, you can get a really pretty nice signal. And then when you shine a bright light on it, it will begin, it'll uh, take a minute and then start to decrease fairly linearly also. Um, and what this is due to is, uh, so when, when the CO2 levels go down under the bright light, this is due to photosynthesis. Um, it's starting, the plants are consuming carbon dioxide and decreasing the carbon dioxide levels. Um, the case in the dark is the one that's more surprising to students. Um, and one of the reasons that we think doing these activities with data are really cool in high school biology because they are, um, that this rise in CO2 is due to cellular respiration, which is not something that kids think of plants as doing. They don't think that plants respire like we do or like animal cells uh, do. They kind of have the, this idea that plants just photosynthesize, so they should only reduce CO2, whereas animals only um, respire. Okay, so we have them create, you know, see, the, see these initial um, CO2 level changes, uh, and then we had one period, um, so this is the, the, fi the Friday of the first week where um, the teacher ran a whole class discussion and they talked about what data that they, what data they um, saw the, in the class period before and what it might be due to. And students had all sorts of ways of making sense of what these, um, what might cause those signals. Uh, a lot of them had an idea that photosynthesis was happening to decrease CO2. And, but the one that was confusing to, to the whole class was um, why CO2 should go back up in the dark. And so uh, some of the ideas, for example, are that uh, when a plant has light, it has everything it needs to survive. And so it's taking in CO2 and decreasing the CO2. If you take away the light, that, that process sort of reverses and it lets that CO2 go again. And so they had this, pro this sort of idea like CO2 is going in and it's getting stored and then it's going back away um, when you turn the light off. Um, a lot of students also had this idea that the plants are dying in the night. When, you ha when plants are in the dark and they don't have the light that they need, they're dying, which means that they're decomposing, which releases CO2 and increases the CO2. So they had lots of ideas going in about what was going on. Um, and then they had, after this, uh, there wasn't any resolution. The teacher didn't tell them what was, what was right or wrong or, uh, or anything about this, but he used this sort of, this variation and ideas that students had to motivate these further, to motivate further inquiry. And so um, the students then had a week uh, to do an independent investigation of something that they either found interesting in or, to, or that they found interesting or um, to choose some variable and vary it. That was the sort of like baseline investigation. Like if you can't think of something that you want to do, choose something, vary it, and see what the effect is. Like see what the effect of, uh, of temperature or different colors of light or um, different intensities of light. Uh, and so they had the next week to do that and then we're going to present their final results on um, Friday to the whole class in presentations. Uh, this was a quick, just like a few, 30 second demo of what that software looks like, just to give you uh, an idea. This is actually um, a slightly updated um, uh, color scheme and stuff uh, than what the students had used. But um, what they do, they can create a program, give it a name, um, 
add some temperature, uh, add some sensor blocks um, and connect to a Raspberry Pi, we'll start getting some data. So this is pretty quick. Um, so what happened here is uh, some temperature, these icons on the screen represent temperature and humidity sensors. Um, you can connect these to this data storage block, which means that those sensors are now going to send their data to storage. Um, connect that, uh, you can save and run the program. Um, and when this happens, then now you're creating a data set. Here it's called map test data set, and um, it has both temperature and humidity data stored in it. And you can go and see your data, and you see it as it's coming in, in the sort of live view of, of, these, of these two variables. Okay. All right, and so students used this, um, and the sensors that they had were, they were temperature, humidity, light, and CO2. And CO2 was the most common um, one because they were supposed to be investigating photosynthesis and respiration. So uh, students did all sorts of different things. Um, there, I mean, there was just there was a lot going on in these in these classrooms, and they they worked in groups uh, on on these projects. Um, I just chose some to show here that I that I thought were interesting in one way or another, and sort of highlight this variation of things that students did. Um, here in the top left um, is a student. Uh, invest, he was investigating um, intensity of light by placing these different um, sheets, uh, colored sheets of paper in between the, uh, this bright lamp and his spinach down in, inside this box. Um, and so he would vary which sheet he was putting in and just collect a bunch of different data sets with these different sheets. Um, this was so, but we also had students do a similar investigation where they were trying to investigate light intensity, but they did it by um, adding more lamps or they did it by placing strips of tape in, in between. So they would cover half of the, half of the place um, with strips of tape and then they would do it again with 25% covered. They would do it again with 75% of, of it covered. Um, and we had some students also varying light intensity by um, placing sheets of wax, additional sheets of wax paper. So they would collect, da they would collect data, um, CO2 data, add another sheet, collect CO2 data again, add another sheet. And so they would get, you know, decrease their intensity sort of gradually with these sheets of wax paper. Um, we had students here up in the top right, um, create a water bath to uh, try and measure their um, measure the CO2 levels uh, of the spinach at different temp at uh, higher temperatures. Um, these students were sort of interesting and I'll talk about them. I'll talk about them later. Uh, um, okay, but yeah, this was this is one way of, of that they came up with to vary temperature. Um, we also had students, so the, you know, both of these students at the top or these groups at the top had sort of a conceptually motivated question, which wasn't true for all of the students. A lot of them were sort of more motivated and engaged with the actual design, with designing ways of doing things. So these students here at the bottom um, worked together and what they were really concerned with, they, they did want to create some, they did want to try and um, collect data at two different temperatures, at two extreme temperatures. So they wanted a frozen spinach case and they wanted a um, hot spinach case. And the way that they wanted to do a hot spinach case was by burning the spinach. Now, this is not necessarily a good experimental design, but the way that they engaged in this um, was to iteratively develop over a long time. And I mean, this entire group was, was engaged in this task of, creating some way of burning spinach and capturing its, its carbon dioxide with the sensor. And so they went through a lot of different iterations of this sort of, this is what they came up with at the end, um, but of ways of like, you know, burning some spinach and putting a lid on top or burning some spinach and sealing it up, but then their bag started to melt. So they lined it with wax paper. And so this was this long sort of iterative process where it is, a lot like descriptions of scientific activity that are just as much about design as they are about concepts. But um, it gave these students in particular this sort of alternative way of, of engaging in this um, activity. And this student um, here was also an interesting one too because they spent a lot of time trying to 
create a really good way of um, collecting carbon dioxide data by sucking out the air first from the container. So what they wanted to do was like boost their signal. So if you remove all the air first, then you have only you know spinach carbon dioxide in there. And so they spent a lot of their class periods on re you know trying to package this thing up and looking at their data and trying to see if they were really sucking out the air and um, then starting their data collection. And so they were kind of interested in this way of of producing good data through design. Um, okay, so these are the two students who I talked about. Um, first, are there any questions? I think now is probably a good time again to. Yes, yeah, so there is a question that came up from um, Rob, which is, do students need to experience clear, simple, reliable data before they experience unruly data to understand their own role and develop conceptual agency? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I know, and I, like just from having done this stuff with students, I can't answer that question for like for sure. Um, I think I think again that this is this sort of tension. Um, we can if they see rely they, they see clear and simple and reliable data, are they going to develop the sense that data is clear and simple and reliable? Because we don't want them to develop that. I think I think we need this idea that data is it's contingent on how it got produced, and you always need to think about how it got produced in order to um, when you're when you're thinking about data. Um, and that it's um, produced intentionally and through design. Uh, so I don't know what the right progression is, you know, if they should start with clear or reliable data um, before they experience this sort of unruly data. I don't, I don't know. And I think it just, I think it really is going to depend on goals of um, instruction. Like if you really want them to, if what we care about, if this is a science content focused course and we want them to come to um, particular understandings of science uh, of conceptual models we want them to arrive at some target model then then I think they do need that clear and simple data um, if you want them to ex to understand the nature of actual data and the nature of science um, and to and, and to ex and for some other reasons I think too uh, then then maybe the un unruly data is okay for um, for starting with. That's great. Um, did anybody else want to chime in on this question? Because it's a really great one. And um, I, I was curious, um, since so many of us have a lot of expertise on data science uh, education and curriculum, if you had anything maybe to chime in on what Lisa just said, or maybe you have something different that you found. Um, I did post a link to um, Tim Erickson's blog post on data science moves for anybody who's interested on that. Um, we, we've been having similar uh, design tensions uh, in our project data science games, and I think that Tim very well, well articulated what is a data science move. And in part of that blog post series, he also discusses a little bit about how to get students thinking from black and white data to unruly and messy data, which is closer to what a data scientist does. So definitely check it out if you have an opportunity. Cool. Yeah, thank you. I worked on a project where we, um, we, we had kids wearing Fitbits. Um, they were sixth graders and we were teaching them the, uh, the basics of statistics. And um, we, I mean, we started right out with pretty messy data, but we presented it as time order data. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, they had the benefit, they had, you know, embodied knowledge of how the data was created. So it was easy to, not surprisingly, most of a, a typical school day, you're not moving very much. So it's pretty flat. And then, so they were, they were able to figure out recess and stuff, but problem, um, there were a couple cases where we presented them with like mysteries, like whose recess is this, you know, child A or B. Um, and, and they were able to work through problems. Like there was one where we were 
trying to figure out whose recess was whose, and we had moved away from the time order data, and we were looking at, um, uh, it was a histogram of steps per minute. Uh, and one of, the, one, one of the students, she had very low steps, and they couldn't, they, it took them a while to figure it out, but they eventually figured it out. It was like, oh, well, that someone, someone else had recalled. She didn't remember. But someone else was like, oh, well, you didn't come out to recess. You were, um, you were helping in the cafeteria serve food. So I, th I think messy is good. Um, I, I don't know if um, – I, th I think it's good to, to not trick the kids that you're ever going to have this perfect data. Um, but that's my opinion. I don't. Yeah, I think I, I like that example. And I, I think you're right about um, producing this sort of data that they're really familiar with and have all of the concept, all, all of what they need to know already to make sense of it, like to, to make sense of um, rather than, you know, to try and make sense to try and um, deal with this data at the same time as they're making sense of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which they don't have everything that they need in order to just explain all these features of the data. But um, starting in these contexts where they do know, um, you know, when their recess was, or uh, they have, they they know how, you know, that they they ran a lot today or something like that. I think those are really good ones for. Uh, That's a wonderful example. Thank you, Ryan. That's just great. Um, Liz also wrote that she likes to do the unruly data first, so as soon as you get a sense of what the work is really like, then sometimes we compare our data to so canonical data and bring healthy skepticism about it. This allows us to have a critical discussion on the cleaner data. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I think that's awesome. Yeah, great question. Thank you for thank you, Rob, for posting that again, and thank you, Ryan and Liz, for chiming in. Um, oh, yeah. I I have a quick question, or maybe it's not quick. I don't know. Um, I so we're working on a data visualization. It's a ten day unit. So one of the things that is a design constraint for the units we create is that they need to be scalable. So we're, they need to work in like real classrooms with teachers that um, may not have any experience with like the technological tools or doing data science. And it has to be like 10 days or we know from experience that teachers, well, a lot of teachers won't do it. You always have like these amazing teachers that will do all this amazing stuff. Um, but it really needs to be, you know, on, available for uptake for, for the, the majority of all teachers. And so that's actually a, turns out to be a really big design constraint. Um, and for data science in particular, we're focusing on air quality because um, it's such a rich area and we want this to be scalable across the country, but be able to have some kind of local regional relevance. Um, and so there's all the EPA air quality data at the ready. So, we have faced this similar problem of, well, we really would like kids to create, to collect some of their own data, you know, just at their school site, et cetera. Um, and then we're dealing with cost issues of the air quality sensors. We're mostly focused on like particulate matter and ozone, and we're going to be overlaying data with asthma and air quality. And so already you can see like 10 days, it's feeling challenging and the best air quality the cheapest one I could find that seems reasonable is still like three hundred dollars so just wondering how you know it seems like if we were to just give them the air quality data from the EPA we'd really be missing out on both a physical hands-on kind of experience and also just all of the things we've been hearing so far about the phenomenological aspects of data collection so just wondering if you have any advice <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, we're in a similar, um, I mean, our project is, it's different in that we're focused on bio phenomena, um, but it's similar constraints in um, just the cost of, the cost of sensors, um, the, what's sort of required of teachers to do these sorts of activities. 
um, the, the teacher who we worked with for um, the stuff that I'm talking about today was this like very particular, he, he really had this interest in students making, um, making, designing things. He was the maker teacher at the school. He had access to, um, he gave kids blow torches and the, the, these kids who burned their spinach. He, I mean, he, he was this very particular sort of teacher who had a unique set of resources for doing this sort of thing already and was very confident with the technology. And so when we get teachers who are less, less sure uh, and they don't have a lot of experience themselves with sensors and data collection, um, I mean, I think it is, I think it is uh, difficult and especially with these cost constraints where ideally we want like every student or at least small groups of students to have sensors that they can go and do these investigations with. But in reality, like there might be one classroom set or there's like the teacher has one carbon dioxide sensor that the whole class needs to use. Yeah. And so I think there, that, that is where I, I see some balance where um, you have a classroom set of what one model that we've talked about is, you know, setting up a, a classroom sensor, not as a demo set, but as a way of, with, with these inter, internet connected, um, sort of internet of things type sensors, uh, that students can all go on and sample the data from it, even though there's only one sensor set. So um, it's a little bit like, you know, an, a station or something like that, a model where, um, sort of like how observatories work, where you log on and get, you know, you get your time with the experimental, with the setup and get, you can run your experiment on it. And I think that that might be a sort of balance where it's a lower cost of hardware. Um, all of this cost, uh, all of the time it takes to prepare all this stuff and get it to teachers and get it on the internet and get these things is not insignificant. And so that might be a good middle ground where the data is still local and in the classroom, but, um, but it's a tenth at least the, the cost of, of getting it there. Um, and I don't know if other people have other questions. If so, I'll wait on my second one. Um, we are having a pretty lively discussion in the back channel, actually, about um, looking at AQ for some of the same reasons that Ari saying. So that's great, Ari, for initiating all that. Thank you. Um, also, welcome, Chad, uh, who just joined us. Um, I don't see any specific questions, but I just wanted to give Ryan and Susanna and Liz a chance to comment if they had anything more that they'd like to say from the back channel. Mm -hmm. Um, with, with, with the one I'm doing, um, the study that, that I'm doing with kindergartners, we're looking at the, the, uh, the daily temperature cycle. So that, that one's pretty, pretty reliable that I think we can detect that and, and, and that they can detect, even detect it and see the pattern. So hopefully I, I think we'll be able to establish that it's a pretty trustworthy data set, but I guess where we'll see noise is is when um, there are days that it, it you know the a, a, a low pressure system moves in or and, and that we don't have like a rise in temperature maybe the temperature falls during the day um, so I, I I guess um, I guess just giving you know having a space for to to discuss the root problems in the data and limitations of what of what your findings are but if if we can you know even with a shared instrument or station if, we, if we're all getting the same thing we, we can talk about the trust trustworthiness of our, our findings um, that's all I have yeah I, I like that uh, I agree with these these times when um, the data does something unexpected, you know, when the temperature drops and you didn't expect it to as these really productive moments for, uh, I think these are places where um, it really does motivate looking at the data in a new way and trying to think about what really could have caused that sort of weird behavior, that weird variation. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I think that that does it does shift things when um, you know if everybody has if everybody has the same data. And I think there's uh, some ways to to create some productive variation. Um, I think if you can give students some choice over like the frequency at which they're collecting data so that they get when do they start their data collection or stop their data collection, things like that, that there's some, um, that you can, that that can also motivate thinking about how those decisions might matter to the data that you get, at least even just visually, how, how your data look different when you sample at different rates or, um, or get different, um, have different sensitivities or different variations. Ryan, were you involved in um, any of the work uh, around uh, the sort of uh, physical sensors from on kids and activity? I noticed from personal experience that even at young ages, kids can tell the narrative behind data that they personally created from an activity sensor, for example. And you'd wonder if some of the choices that you're mentioning there, Lisa, um, even with just a little bit of agency, um, and a little bit of noticing what's happening outside or something would lend themselves to that same kind of small variation connected with a story that I can personally understand. Um, I've been surprised at how powerful that's been in small instances for young kids to be able to see rises and falls on graphs and connect them to temporal changes that they remember. So I haven't yet with the very young kids, with the kindergartners, but I did work on the stuff with... Uh, with Victor Lee with the Fitbits, those are sixth graders. So they were a little older, um, right. but, but yeah, they, they were able to, to, to recall their, their experiences. And that was very powerful in understanding the, the trends in the data. Yeah, it's a very interesting question to think about what at young ages, what kinds of variations, anomalies, or differences in the same data set would be it, uh, interpretable and uh, engender useful conversation is you know what is what is noise for young kids um, is a very meaningful question when we're thinking about data science education. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Sorry, I had another question. I think. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um. Yeah, so this the this idea about variation um, is a kind of a nice segue back into um, this data that we had because um, this particular group, I think it's useful. So there, I think there are many reasons why this variation and allowing students to have data that varies um, are that is useful. One of them is because of this motivating talking about things like noise or um, decision, just decisions that go into producing data and how that affects the data. But um, I think it, that variation also is an opportunity for students to have to, for them to have personal data, you know, that they created themselves. And that really appeals to some students that they created data that's not the same data as other students. And these two um, on, on this slide were actually a really good example of that. Um, one of the things that happened in the classroom, what that, I found I found it to be one of the, one of the most interesting things um, that had happened is that there was one student who in in this activity where they're producing um, they're producing data in the light and in the dark for their spinach. Um, this is actually his graph here on the top right that another student had printed out and labeled. Um, what should have happened in the in the sense that this is what happened for everybody else, um, and that's how they talked about it is what should have happened. Um, it that light should the co2 levels should go up in the dark and should go down in the light and what his did were go up quickly in the dark and go up still a little bit more in the light and so his data had this was just absolutely different than everybody else's and the reason was that he had placed his light sideways um, instead of directly down onto the spinach and so he had um, sort of this lower intensity of the light when the light was on and it wasn't enough to drive down the co2 um, this was really useful, having this different data set that showed something different was really useful conceptually in this classroom because students, including uh, the student Fernando who had produced this, this weird data set, um, 
he started to argue that plants always give off CO2. That even in the dark or even in the light, there's these two things going on. There's, you know, the light makes them, makes them um, t consume some CO2, but that they're always giving off CO2, which is the, actually the understanding that we want them to come to, that respiration is this thing that's always happening. And then photosynthesis can sort of outpace it sometimes when the light is on. But um, what happened is that these other students, these two down here, Linda and Alejandra, um, were su they were really interested in this data set, in this weird data that, um, that uh, this other student had created. Uh, they, but they didn't think it had something to do with the light. They, they didn't think that it was that his light was sideways. They thought it was that since his light was sideways, um, he wasn't cooking his spinach. He wasn't heating it up like the other students had. And so it was this moment of like coming up, ways of coming up with these alternative explanations that are, that are made, you know, the context that created this, this weird light being on, on the side instead of on top like everybody else's. Um, just thinking about what does that mean? What does that mean to create data with your, with your light sideways? Is it really the amount of light that's changing or is it also the temperature? Um, and they thought that since everybody else had been sort of cooking their spinach, um, that they're that are heating it up, that uh, that that was affecting the, these rates of um, producing or consuming CO2. So their follow-up experiment was this one with temperature. They wanted to, to test that idea that they had that would explain his data and why it was different from others. Um, by creating these two conditions, they wanted to have really cold spinach, um, which I think they froze. Um, I can't actually remember exactly what they did to, I know they had an ice bath. So they had an ice bath and they had a, um, a heat bath that they created and put their spinach into this um, hot water with the sensor inside to collect their data. So it sort of initially started with this conceptual question that was really motivated by, um, that was really motivated by this unique data uh, but the, of the other students. But both, um, we had interviewed, we interviewed, um, 18 students and we had interviewed both of them and in both of their interviews um, this idea about uniqueness of doing something your own way or getting um, creating data that's not like other people's was really something that had motivated them they talked about putting their own little twist on an experiment and really valuing um, the, the sort of space to do that uh, I want to hurry up a little bit um, so there, there are another set of students that were interesting in other ways. Um, they oriented to these activities sort of differently. Um, Akeem was one who had initially also had this sort of conceptual question, and it came out a lot in um, the classroom discussion that they had had. Uh, he thought he he wanted to know if res if these respiration rates um, would vary at different starting levels of CO two. So like if you started with if you started with lots of carbon dioxide, would it still produce carbon dioxide more uh, just at the same rate, or would it produce it more slowly since there was already a lot of it? Um, so he started collecting data at these different intervals. He wanted to start with his CO2 at 2,000, at 4,000, and at 8,000, and look at those rates that CO2 was produced at. Um, what happens though is he ran into the sensor maximum. They max out at 10,000, uh, 10,000 ppm. And so he had this sort of problem with the way he was collecting his data. Um, and so they had to sort of adjust how they were trying to do this and switched it to um, collecting at 2,000, 4,000, and 6,000 as these, as these intervals. And the way they were doing this was they would breathe in the bag and sort of like let it try and let out the air a little bit if they overshot it and then like seal it up right when they got to 2,000, 4,000, or 6,000 to start to collect their data. So they were really like when you picture them producing data and think about, um, you know, are they do they see data as something produced in a material context? I think that this sort of this sort of um, experience when they're sitting there like literally breathing on data and trying to seal up a bag to collect it like just right probably are productive um, productive sorts of environments for them to see data as produced in the material world. Um, but the reason that I found these kids interesting was that at some point they realized that this data, um, you know, that even though it, it starts at some level and it starts to increase it, and then it starts at some other level and it starts to increase, that he shifted in the way that he was thinking about whether his data was good data. And it was due to this sort of realization that 
if he's collecting data at these different levels, that they should fit together as one coherent story that, you know, when his 2000 um, data, when his CO2 had risen to 4000, they should basically be at the beginning point of his next graph. And so in his way of thinking about his data, um, sort of emer like, and, and whether or not it was good data, emerged in doing this sort of, um, doing this sort of activity and working with the data as this sort of realization that it should fit together to tell like one coherent story about how CO2 is produced at different levels. Um, and the last student who I wanna talk about a little bit more in depth, this is one that we, um, that we really looked at closely in her um, interview and we um, just submitted a paper um, that largely talks about this one student. Um, she, it, she engaged in this in a sort of different way than a lot of other students um, because she talked about uh, wanting to create this data for a, a personally relevant question. She was interested in gardening um, and she wanted to know why her plants are dying. She, she wanted to, she, she used this sort of data collection opportunity as a way to investigate um, plant death, she, which she was just sort of generally interested in. Um, and so she, the experiment that she did was to collect data in these two side-by-side -side conditions, one where um, the plants were sealed up over, overnight and the other one where they were in this open container overnight. And she wanted to see if she could tell the difference if one had died more uh, than the other the next day. Which I find a really interesting, uh, it, sort of an, th this interesting way of looking at plant death. Uh, you know, it went, and she talks about this in her interview, is, well, you know, I used to think of plant death as plants turn brown, they fall over, um, they kind of wilt. And now, you know, she, and by the end of this experience, she sees it as this, you know, they stop photosynthesizing. They stop affecting the CO2 levels around them. So it was kind of an interesting shift in her way of thinking about um, plant death. Just based on using based on using sensors. Um, one of the things that I found the most interesting about her interview, and that I think speaks to this sort of shifting relationship of that students have with data, is that she talked about the data um, differently in these two cases. And I apologize for these long transcript segments, but it's kind of hard to do like qualitative um, interview research and then present it visually. Uh, so in her observation data. This is the case when, when we said produce two data sets, one in the dark, one in the light. Um, she talked about the ways that she had produced that and contrasted it with other students around her and said that, well, we produced it through this procedure. We produced it carefully. Um, there, we produced it in a way that uh, since there are steps, you cannot mess it up. And um, because you have a less chance of, you know, this reduced chance of messing things up, um, you'll you'll get like more reliable data and so on one on the one hand this is a little bit about maybe about re reproducibility of some procedure like she had a set procedure whereas other students in the classroom they created a dark condition but just by sticking their um sticking their whole data collection setup in, inside a black sweatshirt or something like they just made it dark by whatever methods but she had this like carefully constructed box and considered this to be better because it was more, it required steps. And so she talked about her producing data um, sort of in this analogy to, um, to making a cake by following a recipe, like steps and producing, doing things step by step is good for, is a good way to produce data. Uh, but it's very, she talked about her independent project data in a very different way. Uh, she, and I, uh, you can kind of read through here, um, and I highlighted some of the phrases that suggest that she is thinking about this differently, but she's talking in this second case about her data as um, she, she wants this data. She is trying to get this data. She doesn't want things to interfere with her data. Like she says at, the, at this bottom here, uh, I'm not trying to have that. Like she thought people were inter you know, breathing around her and interfering with her data. And the way that she describes this is this sort of like really active involvement in producing the data, where she's like trying, she's there trying to kind of isolate her data from, from the world, from herself, from her own breathing, so that she can get the data she wants. And I think that this is, I mean, okay, this is one kid, this is one interview, but that this is the sort of shift that we might see 
when we switch activities from the sort of school science investigations that, um, that I talked about earlier, where they're data collectors, to being a data producer. Like she's talking about herself really actively involved. Um, and tying back to the sort of broader um, data science uh, um, themes that we, that we identified earlier, that this sort of experience, when you're really actively, you're involved in producing data in the material world, she's like contending with the materiality of this, of this data collection, um, that these ones are more likely, I think, to, to lead students to these views of data as actively produced, actively produced in the material world through particular methods um, and for particular purposes. Um, I have, I'll just talk in like two more minutes or so. So um, she was also interesting because that this idea of inbuilt knowledge um, that, that I talked about at the beginning, that she had some insight into this. She saw these sensors as these tools that had all this knowledge built into them and all this information that was what uh, this product of other people's time and, time and knowledge that let her see carbon dioxide. And she says like, you know, you can't just stick your finger in there and see carbon dioxide. Like you have to use the sensor that other people have built for you to be able to see it. So that was a, a kind of an interesting insight, but what was interesting to us was about the way that she talked about it. It was that um, she saw this as sort of empowering that you can now see CO2, you can do these investigations um, that you couldn't have otherwise done. Uh, it was humbling. Like she felt she had this sort of recognition that everything around her, the software, the sensors, had all this built in um, knowledge into it, which she saw as, uh, it, in a way that I'm, I'm calling humbling, you know, that she felt that she knew so little about the world um, that she, she thought she knew something about plants, but there's this whole other, like, hidden, you know, hidden world that's going on that she was able to see with, with um, these sensors. And uh, during the interview, she like turns to the wall next to her and she was just like, you know, I know this is a wall, but I don't even know like what is in it, you know? So just this idea that there's all this invisible stuff going on, on around us that we can see um, due to these sorts of tools. Um, and also motivating. So she said something uh, that, it, it, and here she says, come on, you need to get yourself in science more. Um, but in the rest of the interview, she talked about, um, you know, this fear of turning 30 and not knowing what all this technology was. And so uh, she, she saw this as, you know, this opportunity to kind of gain access to that, to that knowledge, to that, to that knowledge that's embedded in all this um, technology as part of this sort of motivating, she had described herself as bad at technology, but this was an opportunity to like learn more about how to use those sensors and to sort of get herself into science and technology a little more. Um, and the last, the last thing, uh, you know, in her, this is, um, this is Hope, and here's uh, Talia right here. She was in um, the classroom working with us, and um, she, so Hope got to the stage where she had imported her data into CODAP. Um, she called Talia over as this, uh, um, you know, the, the resident CODAP expert and had her, asked her questions about how to label her points, how to color her points, how to um, just reduce the amount of data. She wanted to show only like nine points um, right at the beginning of each of her two graphs. Uh, so she was, she had pulled up a chair for Talia and was pretty like insistent um, on extracting information from her. Uh, what was interesting at this moment though, and what came out in the interview with, with Hope was that, um, so what had, what had happened for her is that when she originally produced these two graphs, one for her CO2 levels in the dark, or, I'm sorry, in the closed container and one in this open container, um, the way that our software, the way that Dataflow shows these graphs, um, they're auto, they're, they were created as two separate graphs and they're auto scaled. The sizes of the axes are scaled by the software. But what auto scaling does is mean that every, any linear graph looks identical because they're scaled to the exact same browser size, window size. So she saw these two graphs at the end of her experiment for these two different conditions that looked identical. And at first she thought she was confused by this, that these two graphs for her two conditions looked the same, 
until she imported them to Kodak and could see them on the same graph and saw that they actually had very different values. Even though they looked the same with, these, with this particular scaling, that they had different values and were actually very different. So this sort of moment I think was useful, was a, th this points to a sort of useful moment about switching views of data, switching the ways that data is visualized and shown and the way that axes are, are scaled in, the, in this instance. Um, as a way of recognizing how uh, how these tools and how these ways of looking at data have that sort of um, have this sort of rhetorical power, you know, with this with this view of data on the same axis, she can see um, she can use that to say, look, these are different. This one died more. This one died less. This one's producing CO two faster, consuming CO two faster. Um, but that doesn't mean that the other view wasn't useful to her. So what she said about the, the data flow view where these two graphs looked the same was that she knew she had created her conditions well because the same, the data were similar. Like just the fact that she produced, you know, a linear graph in this one and a linear graph in this one suggested to her that she didn't do anything wrong. Like she didn't do anything weird in setting up one of her conditions that they must have been really similar um, if they were produced such similar looking data, qualitatively similar data. So that was, um, you know, this way where she used these two different tools and these two different views of the same underlying data to make sort of two different claims, both about, you know, the underlying scientific idea and also about how well she had, um, how well she had sort of performed her experiment. Uh, okay, so um, just to like sort of go back and summarize, um, we're thinking about the ways that uh, science learning experiences in science class um, can prepare students to have this particular sort of understanding of data that we think is valuable. We want them to see it as produced in the material world in ways that sort of um, promote that way in ways that motivate this teasing apart of you know what's what's a real phenomenon and what's um, an artifact of how this phenomenon got or how this data got produced. Um, we want them to see data as produced through technology by technologies. It's not just naturally existing. It doesn't it doesn't just exist in the world to be collected. It's produced by people with technologies that are designed for it. Um, I think Hope had some insight into that, and uh, and that data um, is produced for purposes. That's the that's our sort of third point. We want to, them to see that data are they're produced in a context for a particular um, for particular purposes. Uh, they have rhetor different. They have rhetorical power. Um, data can be used to make an argument. Um, and I think this is the one where, you, like, what if we if we sort of look back at what sorts of experiences in science education do students need to have? Um, this really speaks to, I think, these two here more um, to what we were talking about is the sort of mangle of practice where students are heavily involved in sort of design work of designing um, experiments to create particular types of data um, to contend with materiality, but that this also needs to happen in sort of a, um, in like a, an inquiry classroom that th that they can be engaged in argument with data that they need to be making claims to other students or to um, within within this within the classroom um, to be able to present their data or have more opportunities to argue with one another around the data and to do some negotiation of uh, what kind of data are valuable or powerful um, in the, in in that uh, inquiry context. Um, Okay, I think I'm done. Are there any uh, are there any questions? I see some stuff going on in the back channel. Um, just a quick comment to, to follow up on the question of resources and um, also data science education resources. I started a list in Google Docs here which anybody can access and edit if they'd like to add some stuff. I know Chad, you mentioned that you are looking for references as well, so that'd be a good place to post that information. Um, and as far as the back channel goes, I'll let Lisa go ahead and get up to speed. And if you wanna go ahead and respond or react to anything, Lisa, that'd be great. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just note that part of the conversation that was going on there was around these, this question about trustable data and um, what that means. Uh, and uh, I noted in um, one of the references I'll find in post uh, that we'd done some looking in our work on the inquiry space projects into uh, this, this question of anomalies and how they were very focusing for students. Um, and that that leads into leads into or bleeds into the question of um, what's reliable, what you know, what's meaningful within data, etc. Um, which becomes a really interesting and complicated brew when you're dealing with um, heterogeneous experimental setups and and the like, uh, because it's um, it's great that they're focusing, and half the time it's great because they're meaningful, and the other half the time it's not, and it's a weird forest. Any other questions? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, Lisa, if you can go ahead and stop screen sharing, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Apologies, I have too many uh, windows open. Um, so I'll just go ahead and um, improvise and wrap up just here. So, okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Once again, I really had a terrific time on this webinar and thank you everybody for sharing your ideas. Uh, Ryan, I see you're clapping. Thank you for that too. Um, if we did not get to your question or you would like to leave additional questions by Twitter or email, please do so. We'll respond to you tomorrow. We had a lot of great interaction um, and I'm really grateful to all of you for making such rich discussion happen. We will send you a link to the recorded session shortly by Eventbrite. And if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to attend future data science education webinars, our next webinar is on September 19th with Andy Rubin, who will be speaking about bringing data science to middle school students. So I think that might be of interest to some of you. Uh, details will follow shortly in that email that I will be sending out. You can sign up for future webinars at concord.org forward slash meetup. You can stay connected with us on Twitter at CodeAppDataSci. If you use the hashtag DataSciEd to tweet us any additional questions or resources, we'll be happy to respond to you there. Please feel free to also visit our website, codeapp.concord.org, to connect with us as well. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to hearing from you again soon. Thank you.